Today, we begin anew. We begin anew. With a clean slate and a breath of fresh air, we turn our liturgical calendars, we change the colors in the sanctuary, set up the Advent wreath and the candles, and prepare for the birth of Jesus. There really wasn't a choice when it came to a sermon series for the season of Advent, Home for Christmas. I'll be honest with you, <laughs> Tim and I have a difference of opinion about the world's greatest Christmas song. Even with the crooners like Bing Crosby or Michael Blue I'll Be Home for Christmas comes just in front of Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. <laughs> the song is sappy, <laughs> sentimental. Oh. It also sets up some pretty unreasonable expectations about the weather. Also, it gives the illusion of the perfect family with the perfect family Christmas, complete with Instagram-worthy presents. But I'll admit, the song does have a certain poignancy. I mean, I don't know about you, but where else are you going to be? It's 2020. There is a countywide stay-at-home order because of a raging coronavirus pandemic. We'll all be home for Christmas, right? We don't have a choice. We'll be home for Christmas. Where else would we be? We're prepared for vaccine care and life that is mask free. Christmas Eve, you'll find me on your laptop screen. I'll be home for Christmas on a sanitizing spree. Woo! <laughs> oh, Christmas 2020, you will be memorable for sure. This year, if you started sentences with, we were hoping to, or I was planning on at any point, you were soon shaken out of your cheery mood. When we look back on the year, maybe we'll reminisce about the things we missed. What wasn't there? Who wasn't there? The things we did without. Or maybe we'll share what an odd and weird time this really was. Maybe we'll take the opportunity to share what we learned about this year and in the world, what we learned about others and what we learned about ourselves. Maybe we'll share that the image of perfect is really hard to come by. Take what was deemed the most perfect Christmas tree being set up in Fountain Square in Cincinnati. Take a second look. The 65-foot Norwegian spruce looks like a few of us, misshapen and a bit bedraggled. One spectator who saw it thought, I honestly didn't know that a tree could look like that. <laughs> Another person thought Cincinnati's tree represents us all. It's doing the best it can. Even when it's all spruced up, pun intended, it is still just a little off. Perhaps this year is the model of pandemic perseverance. This year's scraggly tree is doing the best it can, just like all of us. In the past, when I preach on the first Sunday of Advent, I think the texts that we read this morning are a bit out there. It's really hard to put into present-day words the apocalyptic events that are portrayed here. But it's 2020, and our texts this morning seem to be right on target. In the texts, the world is in crisis. Unusually, usually, that claim asks us to make a leap, quite a leap of our imagination, but not this year. Our world is in crisis, a global pandemic, hospitals full to overcapacity, fires and hurricanes, floods, things are not good. The text acknowledges that. This morning, in this morning's reading, stars are falling from the sky. And the text acknowledges the strange reality that we're living in, in this Advent season. This year has brought into view the fragility of the lives we have made for ourselves and reminded us painfully 
that we are not, on our own, sufficient to the challenges of life in this world. Isaiah's cry, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, it's our cry, even if we have a hard time giving it voice. Isaiah's plea to God is as, as simple as it is stark. Show up and do something. Which is right where Mark's intentional retelling of Jesus' apocalyptic parable points us. There are certainly nods to the end of times in Jesus' message that God will come at some point to right all wrongs and settle all accounts and restore creation. So when, according to Mark, will the day and hour of God's unveiling be? Maybe not so much at the end of time. Maybe at the cross, in the hidden and the, unexpe and the expected unveiling of God's greatest work, at the cross. In that small and broken figure of Jesus on the cross, God was at work, rending to pieces all, the all that would divide us from God, closing the gap between what we deserve and what God wants to give us, promising to be with us and for us and through all things. Maybe God, yet again, will come this year amidst the bedraggled and the scraggly places of our lives and of this world, and do God's work again. Coming to turn the world aright, to bring down the corrupt, to let the oppressed go free, that's the work of this season. And in Advent, we know things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And there are times when uncertainty and mystery can't be explained away. This text reminds us that it isn't a new experience. The not knowing, the not having all the pieces together. This reading feels so relevant to us, more relevant than it ever has been. Well, the sky is falling, it seems, and no one really knows what's going to happen next. So what then are we to do? Jesus has words of wisdom for such a moment. Keep alert, stay awake, pay attention. Our modern day world would call that mindfulness. It's about paying attention, living in the present reality, which is the only reality. Jesus invites us to look at what right, what's right in front of us, to see God at work in what is happening here and now. This text cautions us against sinking back into nostalgia. The past was better than the present, and I would like to go back there. It also warns us against too much speculation about what we hope will be a rosier future. That takes us out of the present moment. And Jesus wants us to be present in this moment, alert for the signs of God's presence. Maybe as we find our way in this season, we'll go overboard on the decorations or the presents or the cookies or those cute inflatable lawn ornaments because of all the things we didn't get a chance to do. Maybe we'll see the things that we hold so closely, those things that stress us out, that cause us undue angst and worry. Maybe we'll focus on different things this year. And as we do, remember it's in the small things that makes this season memorable. So whatever our usual and admittedly at times over the top preparations for Christmas, fundamentally Christmas is about the small things. A baby, his parents, the bottom of the economic ladder shepherds, wandering astrologers looking for someone to save the world, deep-held longings of presence and redemption, giving voice to Israel's prophets. This year, perhaps we'll hear that promise more clearly, that whenever and wherever we act in love, God is present. So indeed, 
watch, wait, look, and especially listen. For in the Christ child who will grow up to embrace all of our longings and experience all aspects of our lives, God is whispering, Emmanuel, I am with you. When we are the most attentive to what's going on in our lives and not distracted by the busyness of the season, we, we can relax and tell an old story in a new way about the journey to the manger and the birth of a savior. Maybe we'll have more time for that, more time for each other, more time for Jesus, more time for God. Maybe we'll look at all that is around us and say to all of it, it's sufficient, that'll do. All that we have now and all that we are is sufficient, it's enough. It's good to be enough for the one who is entering the world to make all things new. And so may you enter this season deeply and keep awake, stay alert to the most amazing and yet sufficient ways that we can be in in this time and in this place.